everyone and welcome to a Facebook Live with myself, Dr. Sean Powell, and also we're lucky to have Nikhil in the house. Thank you for joining, Nikhil. Thank you. So, Thanks for inviting me. No, you're welcome, Nikhil. Thanks a lot. So just to give you a, a bit of a background, my name is Dr. Sean Powell, and we're going to be talking about a brand new topic today. It's called Stop <laughs> Surviving, Start Thriving. Stop Surviving, Start Thriving. In, and the importance of understanding your nature and living by it. Wow, big words, what does it mean? Well, we're gonna get into that just very shortly, a bit sort of an introduction by myself. I'm Dr. Sean Powell, that's drshawnpowell.com. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, I've been a doctor for around 11 years. Doesn't feel that long, but it's 11 years. And um, I kind of got interested in uh, root cause medicine, that's kind of my specialty for around, um, well, I think when I worked in refugee camps, and I really developed a great passion. Obviously, in refugee camps, you can't, you know, take, you can't do blood tests, you can't do expensive scans. All you've got is literally your hands and the stethoscope. So it's about working with the things around you. And I really got passionate about finding out how we can make small changes to make a big effect on our lives. So that's kind of like where I got into lifestyle medicine, root cause medicine, and all those things. Um, so those are the. Those are the main things that um, I was focusing on. And so, as I said, I've been doctor for 11 years, really enjoy what I'm doing. And we're setting up these weekly Facebook live events just to, and Zoom events to just spread the knowledge about well-being and health. Because I really believe prevention is the cure. That's really what I really want to focus on. And just a few tips, obviously, um, this is just general advice in nature. If you want to see a medical practitioner, please do. If you have any questions, obviously see the medical advisor, this advice is general. And I'm very lucky and fortunate to have a good friend of mine, Nikhil, in the house or in the Zoom call. How are you doing, Nikhil? Oh, he can't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, Technical problem. Hello, Nikhil, like can you hear me? Very well. Hello. Hey, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I'm here. I'm here. I'm in the house. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad it's the weekend. And um, yeah. as much as we're locked up, it's always nice to have a bit of a break to rejuvenate and recoup. Um, For sure. Very important. <laughs> Very important not to work as well as work. True, man. Yeah. Don't work too many hours. Find that balance, right? Find the balance. And that's what we'll talk a bit about today as well. Yeah. So For those to... who are thriving can work 24 hours a day and not feel exhausted. <laughs> yeah. You need to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Nikhil is, I've known him for a long time, but he's been a monk for several years and he really uh, looked at imbibing spiritual knowledge and applying it practically to the workforce. And he's now a consultant in a major firm in London. They're actually a global firm. And he focuses on workforce transformation uh, for leaders and their workforce and, in, and improving their general well-being and health. Is that correct, Nichols? Anything else you want to say? Yeah, around basically around developing leaders for the future, understanding how to create conducive learning environments for people. And also then looking at how we reward and, and the well-being sort of aspects for, for workforces around the world. Um, as things are changing so much in the world, the demands and expectations on humans um, obviously change and the introduction of robotics, you know, changes the way people do jobs and there's a huge sort of skill shortage and all these kind of things come into consideration. So I sort of focus on, on a broad range of, of aspects to help humans be better at work and, and work be better for humans. As well. Great. Yeah. Great. Thanks again for joining us, Nicole. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction about this topic. Stop surviving, start thriving. So I just want all of you just to stop for a minute and just think about how you feel. Are you satisfied in your job? I mean, are you happy in what you're doing? Um, just think about it. For me personally, I find a lot of patients are quite unsatisfied with their job. They don't find they get much joy with it. Those that are really happy in the job are very fortunate, but many the patients that I know and people in general don't find happiness uh, with regards to their jobs. And a lot of people find their job sort of is part of their identity. So like, you know, I'm an accountant or I'm a pharmacist or I'm a doctor. Their job in a way defines who they are. And I can talk about my own personal experience. You know, I am, my first degree was actually in e-commerce and digital business. And I worked in as a technology consultant for about a year, but um. <laughs> I enjoyed the degree, but when I started working, I realized I really didn't want to do that job. It wasn't really who I was. I wasn't finding happiness in it. 
So I went back to basics, looked at my values, find out what I really wanted to do. And there are sort of three values that I focus on, which I kind of think I, I adhere to, which are like, one is justice, one is, um, well, the other one is, um, so it's so popular, I forgot. <laughs> but um, I think it's impact and, um, I can't remember the other one, but there's three values, that's good. But essentially what I found was that my job didn't make me happy. So I actually went back to basics and studied medicine and it's funny because I thought, you know, there's too many Asians involved in medicine. I don't want to follow the typical Asian route. But I actually really enjoy it. I'm very happy in my job. And I'm thankful that I changed my course and became a doctor. Um, and there's a, there's a term in, in Sanskrit called Dharma. Dharma means, you know, the right direction. Um, and it's a term that people sort of are becoming more fashionable to hear about. And there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, which is an ancient Hindu text. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, um, better to live your own dharma imperfectly than to live an imitation of someone, somebody else's life imperfectly. So essentially, it's about, you know, I'm really passionate about finding direction. So when I talk to patients, obviously, they come in with physical ailments, I help them. But sometimes if there's mental ailments, or there's things that I can sense that are going on, I do ask them, like, how they're feeling, what's their purpose in life, what's their direction. And I actually give patients like a value sheet. So I'm like, listen, let's talk about it. Let's find out what your values are. Then they come back and we look at their values and find out what direction they're going in. Because going in. I think it's important to find happiness in where you're going and what direction you're doing. So finding and adhering to your values or finding out what your direction is, is really important. Um, and I'm just going to pass it on to Nikhil now just to have a chat and continue the conversation. Thanks, Nikhil. Yeah. I don't know what your thoughts are. Thank you. Thanks, Rishi. I mean, it's really, it's, this topic is really, really vast, actually. So Dharma, and it will, I'll go a little bit into what Dharma actually means um, in its root cause, and um, some of the benefits we can sort of um, gain from understanding our Dharma, our nature, as it were. Um, it's a huge buzzword, like at the moment, you know, there's like every, every self-development video you see online is all about finding your nature, do what, you know, follow your heart, find your passion, these kind of things. And the, the, the big thing is it sounds brilliant, it sounds exciting, um, but one, it's not very easy to follow. And secondly, there's many challenges that actually oppose us according to like the natural uh, conditioning of life, the way society is set up currently, uh, the way the capitalist world functions and the values the capitalist world functions within, and how that can really be challenges to people actually finding and thriving in their own, in their own dharma. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of interesting models out there. So essentially, if I was to just define dharma, um, initially, the one, the first thing I think you, you plugged on it initially, Rishi, is about at the moment. If we if we look at the you know the Western world as it were, and even you know parts of the Eastern world as well, people now is there's not so much of a struggle to get food on on the table and a roof over our head. A roof over our head. It's not as much of a struggle as it was, um, uh, you know, earlier on in, in the early nineties, um, you know, nineteen twenties, thirties, fifties, etc. So people aren't having to function with a survive, survival uh, sort of attitude or mentality. Um, we actually have the luxury of having so many uh, opportunities around us, so many learning experiences, so many different types of avenues. Uh, in terms of discrimination, discrimination is being chopped up left, right and center. So it doesn't matter who you are, but there's more, there's more uh, opportunity than ever to actually experiment with sort of different uh, fields of work uh, different sort of activities to really find out what do you really thrive in? What kind of activity do you thrive in? What kind of environment do you thrive in? And ultimately, if we can gear our careers. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, if we can, yeah, if we can cater or, or govern our lives around those principles or something that we really thrive and feel happy in and are very connected to, at least on a value-based um, system, then it can really alleviate a lot of the difficulties in life that we feel currently. Like I feel sometimes in life, people are struggling so hard with their jobs, which takes basically, let's say, in the ideal world, five days a week, nine to five. But to be honest, you know, it's really six, seven days a week, nine to nine yeah. these days. And, and you're, you're, you're going on for... Um, Oh, he seems to have lost him. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I think 
it's been a technical problem either with my microphone or with Nikhil's. Um, so hopefully we're joining us shortly, but I think that's a very valid point. We tend to work, you know, nine to five is obviously when is, you know, we tend to work, but actually we tend to work longer hours than just nine to five. They're not just going to work. And, you know, it's not just sitting down at the desk. It's also the commute normally it's going from your home to your office and backwards. I know that sort of changed with COVID times, but it's actually a very important point that we find that our, like Daniel Lucas was saying that, you know, that our job, you know, most people ask, what are we doing? How are we doing things? Our job also defines who we are as people. Um, and that's something that's, you know, important to understand and know about. I think um, in the conversation with Nicola, we were talking actually about, you know, we were having a chat before about, you know, how do we actually work through things? And Albert Einstein had a really fascinating quote. It's saying that everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Yeah. So everyone, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. That's a very important quote. And what it's sort of saying is that if you don't know where you're heading or you know what your purpose is or what your goal is, then you also find that it's difficult to adhere to things. Nicole, you're back. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah, my, my Wi-Fi cut out. Apologies for okay. that. No problem, no problem. Difficulties of the digital world. <laughs> it's okay. I was just talking about Albert Einstein's quote, you know, uh, yeah. Um, do you want to uh, just talking about how you know fish out of water sort of thing, climbing a tree? Yeah, I, I, and it's you know when we're when we're let's just talk about career. Let's just hold it down to that example because it can be applied to many aspects of our life. But let's just talk about career. When we talk about career, many people are working jobs they don't like, right? They can do the job, but they don't find any value in it. It's not necessarily having any big contribution to the world's needs. Um, and they therefore they don't feel fulfilled. And so after a 10 hour shift at work, they come home feeling absolutely mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, and really having no enthusiasm or energy for their family, their partner, their children, perhaps, or any other sort of recreational activities. It has such an impact on our internal well being and mental well being. And then on top of that, if we feel that we're doing an activity we don't like, we can just get by in doing it. But the person next to us is so in the zone, so in the dharma of that particular activity. Let's just take, for example, accounting. It's just for argument's sake. You have person X who is hating it, but just does it and slogs it along because society has told him accounting is a good job. It will give you a good salary of X amount. And, you know, it set you up nice for setting up a nice life. Fine, no problem. But then you have person Y next to that individual who's thriving being an accountant, loves being an accountant, is completely in tune with it, logically, very systematic, loves numbers, loves everything about accountancy and thrives. And when person X sees person Y thrive so much, how do you feel person X feels? They feel, I'm not good at this. My self-esteem is destroyed. My sense of self-worth is destroyed. You know, my, the parameters of success I'm being measured against are completely wrong because it's a fish out of water. That is the fish trying to climb the tree, being measured against a monkey trying to climb the tree. The fish isn't supposed to be on the tree, right? And so on this, before I get into sort of defining dharma, is we need to, the, the, the basis is we need to stop telling people, and this is one of the lies we will we'll report as children as well, we need to stop telling people that anything you put your mind to, you can be the best at. You might, be, you might become very talented at it, but it doesn't mean it will holistically satisfy you in life, right? Um, and I've often found this is, is and, and it goes back to Vishay, as you were saying at the beginning, what are your values in life? Do you just want to work a job to earn money to make a good, uh, you know, standard of life? Okay, no problem. But do you want to live a job where you feel the possibilities for growth and potential and holistically in your life feels feel happy and purposeful? That is such a holistically rich way of living, is, is, is what I feel. And this is where Dharma really um, comes into play. And I've got a bit of a, a story or an example, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's okay to share. Which yeah. Is, put this yeah. in context. So Dharma is essentially an ancient Sanskrit term, which comes from, uh, obviously, the Vedas, uh, the ancient literature of India. And, and Dharma is not just a model about finding your nature. Like in Japan, you have this Ikigai model, which is also a fantastic model, you know, basically 
just to summarize that. You find out activities which you love, which you're good at, uh, activities you can get paid for to maintain your life, and activities that the world needs. And when you find one activity that satisfies all four of those quadrants, um, that's essentially known as your ikigai or your reason for being, your, your calling, your purpose, etc. Um, and what, what, what's fascinating about dharma is dharma isn't just about activity. Dharma is, also goes into the intention you do at certain activities. Everyone has different motivators. Everyone has different value systems. Everyone, everyone works with different intentions. And then also those activities and intentions can be coupled. So those intentions can be coupled with certain activities, which create quite a powerful combo. So how do you get to that intention with the you know, activity? So obviously I want to be a doctor. So that's yeah. my intention, right? Or my activity, my values. You know, what, yeah. how would you channel both of them together? You know what I mean? Yeah, and no, that's, that's, that's a good point. And what's more important than activity is your intention. So if I was to ask you, like, why, why were you a doctor? Well, it sounds cliche, but to help people, right? To right, but there are many people who became doctors because they wanted to earn lots of money. <laughs> Yo. Right? That's true. It's not true, though. You don't earn lots of money. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but there are, there, are, there are people who, yeah. who would have because it's a high paying career, they understand the medical field, right? Now, you can be doing the same activity, but two people have two different value-based systems. Yeah. And therefore the dharma of those two individuals are actually very different, even though the activity may look the same because they'll do the activity for certain for different reasons, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll get, I'll get into that in a bit second, but I just want to share a story which I find will, will contextualize this for everyone listening, just to understand what dharma means and the effects of, of dharma. So. In, in a scripture called the Bhagavatam, which is essentially the essence of the Vedic literature, <laughs> imagine the Vedic literature, then you have the Bhagavatam, which is, I say the essence, but it's still 12 books long. So it's you know, quite, quite a vast um, A lot of knowledge there, a lot of knowledge. Yeah, it's a lot. It's an like amazing book, um, very practical, very deep knowledge for all aspects of life. And I encourage anyone who has a copy to, to, to definitely read it. So in, this, in, in, in the Bhagavatam, it explains the Dharma through an example of, of a cow, um, an elephant. And a crocodile. So the elephant and its, um, you know, wife or, or you know, partner and the child, they go into the watering hole to replenish. So they're off to the watering hole. Um, and in the watering hole is crocodiles. So what, what happens is the, the father elephant tests the water out before he lets his wife and, and child uh, go in. And now his wife and child are obviously a lot older as well. They're quite big elephants, very strong. Um, elephants, you know, can kill from their stampede. He tests the water out. He goes into the water. He tests the water out, and to test the water out, he puts one of his feet into the water, just to just to his knees. And then the crocodile in the water, however, it's lunchtime, and the crocodile's hungry. Crocodile sees a tasty elephant foot. The crocodile goes, takes a snap, grabs onto the foot, and then there's a bit of a battle between the crocodile and the elephant. Now, what happened, and it is explained in this, is for the crocodile in this fight that's happening right now, the crocodile's mental power, physical strength, and sensual awareness, so the ability of its senses to become aware of its surroundings, all increase. And what I, what I mean by mental power is I mean enthusiasm. Physical strength is general health. And also the sensual awareness is just the power of the senses. All increase. But for the elephant, it's explained, the elephant was out of its dharma, and therefore the mental, physical, and sensual strength and awareness all decreased. Even though we, can, we know that the elephant is a lot stronger, the elephant had the, the, the wife and the children and the child. So it's, it's, in terms of numbers, it's outnumbered the crocodile. In terms of strength, it's outnumbered the, the crocodile. Um, but the small crocodile still was defeating the elephant in that battle, and the elephant was taking him into the water. And it explains that the, the reason for this is due to dharma. The elephant is a land animal, it's a mammal. It belongs on land. When it gets into water, it's not built psychophysically to survive and thrive in water. Whereas the crocodile is in its element, it's in its dharma, and therefore, even if it's opposed with a stronger opponent on, on, on the, on the of higher scope of things, uh, 
actually the, the, the crocodile was a lot more powerful due to its being a dharma. So what it is, it's almost like in martial arts, this, they stress the importance of being in the right stance, uh, even if you're defending. Because if someone's attacking you, if your stance is strong, with a block, you can knock over the opponent, even if you're defending. You're a black belt, are you? In ninjutsu or jujitsu? Are you? He's gone. He's gone again. <laughs> That's very interesting. So talking about stances, talking about movement, it's a, a very important thing. And um, his internet's gone all funny again. But the most important thing is that, like Nicole was saying, that you know your stance. You know, if someone is powerful, you know the stance itself can fight as well as block obstacles. So um, I think. I remember one of my friends, Danny, he's a martial artist actually. And um, he was, you know, he's learning, well, he was learning black belt. He's a martial artist now. And um, I think the story was when he, when he was, I think he, he was learning, he was attacking a black belt. And I think, um, yeah, it's not actually funny. <laughs> no, I don't know that story actually. I was gonna give it to Nickel to talk about. But the main thing I'm we're back. talking about, oh, you're back, Nickel. Sorry, I, I don't know what's going on with my Wi-Fi today. All right, man. Apologies. Get off Sorry, Virgin. Is it Virgin Media? Is it Virgin Media? If it's Virgin Media. It is Virgin Media, yeah. So bad, Virgin. Anyway, let's take all your money. Let's not go into Virgin Media. <laughs> Fine, so that was good about the stance, uh, about the martial yeah. artist thing. And you were talking, we could talk about like, how. so how do you get in tune or how do you like focus on becoming, like focusing on your dharma, you know? How do you know when yeah. you're in your so, dharma and your flow? For sure, no, definitely. And um, so what I'll share with you guys is basically when you do a particular activity, it's, it's important to do two things. One is to focus on um, how do you feel during the activity mm. and how do you feel after the activity? So I, I think what I'll share with you guys is a few points. And as I sort of go through these points, if anyone who is listening, just to think about activities, scenarios, environments, or situations, they felt that when they were in, they could relate to these certain effects or points. And I'll read these out, and as I sort of talk through them, if anyone listening just has a little think about, oh, yes, I did feel a bit like that. Yes, I did feel like that when I was doing that activity or scenario or environment. That's a, initially a good way to actually start to figure out what your dynamic activity could be. Um, and then I'll go into a bit of, uh, I'll point it out in more specifics in terms of intentions and four different types of dharma. Um, so basically, when you're in tune with your dharma, you feel as if you lead a meaningful life and you feel like it totally satisfies you. Um, you don't just do well in the activity, but you can't imagine not doing it. Yeah, that's an important one. Uh, mostly people and circumstances come into your life effortlessly and help you move forward. So when someone's in their dharma, people naturally in environments want to help you because they can see you're thriving in that particular activity. Your gifts and talents, they come to your aid so you have the strength to easily accomplish any work. And this next one is really, really important. And it's one that I personally see and have an effect on in my life and, and I hold very dearly, is you take wise risks and remain confident because you know it, you will be protected by dharma. And what that means is for someone within their dharma, they're happy to take further and further challenges. They're not scared. They have an air of fearlessness about it. They have a sense of quiet confidence, as I like to call it. Um, so when they're challenged with this particular situation within their dharma, they're quite confident that I'll tackle that. Even if I fail, I'm confident to try that. And I know that one day I can overcome that particular um, that challenge, whatever it may be. And from a sort of a health level as well, it's explained that you're generally in good health. And if illness does come, uh, you, can, you can quickly deal with it as well. And I think that comes from the fact that internally you feel very very happy, you feel very healthy, you feel very confident, and it's having an external effect on your, on your body as well. And, and I'm sure you can share some sort of insights on that as well in terms of internal and external well-being, how there, there's a bit of a connection between the two. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, being in your zone, I suppose, you know, in your dharma, right? When I'm in my zone, you know, I, I suppose, you know, when I was doing my first degree, it was okay, like I did it, you know, it was not bad, I... I sort of enjoyed it, but definitely when I was in medicine, studying medicine, I really thrived on, I suppose that the, you know, theoretical thing was okay, but when I saw patients, you know, meeting people, interacting with them, seeing the transformation with them really, really helped me to zone into my, or get into my zone, I suppose, or my dharma, because 
And then there were people around me that were sort of buzzing. We sort of vibed off each other, talked about patient cases. You know, you really get to learn so much more, you know, when you're in your zone. Yeah. I really enjoy it actually talking to patients, meeting them face to face and getting feedback and stuff. So you're right. And there's a difference, you know, with patients that I see as well, you know, they're doing a job because they've got a mortgage, they've got a wife, they're doing all these things, you know, and sometimes when you're at this state of life, you can't, it's difficult to change, you know, you have financial responsibilities, totally. all those things. So, you know, it's about working out what your values are, but, you know, adapting it in a slow way. So for example, if you, you know, you're working, doing an admin job, you want to do a psychologist, potentially, I don't know, Yeah. you could study psychology, you know, once a week or attend some work courses yeah. or do something that kind of makes you happy and see if that's your element. Yeah. Because for me, when I was deciding what my career was going to be, I um, actually did some work experience, you know, in the hospital again and, you know, went to some care homes and saw it. Is that kind of something that I wanted to do? So yeah. sometimes testing out that experience is a good thing as well to see if you're in your zone. And things will naturally start happening, you know, in terms of you're internally, you feel better, you feel more motivated, mm -hmm. you start taking healthier, you know, options in your life rather than feeling, if you're depressed and you don't enjoy your job, you're probably eating like, you know, fizzy drinks, you know, eating like fast food, you won't feel so motivated, right? It slows you down. Definitely. Whereas if you're kind of focused and buzzy, you try to eat healthy, you do all these things so you can just, you know, mm -hmm. be the best you can at the job and, and what you're doing, right? Yeah. And, and, and you make a good point, Rishi, you know, this topic for, for people maybe who are in their teens, early 20s, you know, they've got a bit more time on their hands, but especially as you're slightly older, people have families, mortgages, bills to pay. It's not easy to make that shift. And I don't think that's the point um, that needs to be made. The point that needs to be made is we can always experiment with an hour of our week. If we yeah. take like an hour of your week to, in today's world, when, again, like I said at the beginning, there are so many options to experiment and adventure with different experiences. If you take an hour of your weekend, just prioritize an hour, you know, what else are you going to do? Watch Netflix or something like you might as well, you might as well invest an hour of your week to, you know, could possibly change the future of your, your life direction um, to experiment with something. Do a course, do this, volunteer. Like you said, you went into care homes, right? To see, that's like a fantastic example of that. And, um, and that's something I sort of learned when I was, when I was living in the monastery, living in the temple as a monk. Before that, I'd done the master's in engineering, so a technical degree, very technical. I loved cars, right? I like cars, motorbikes, all that kind of stuff. Did engineering. Yeah, it was interesting, great. But it wasn't focused around people and it was what people I really liked. So then I experimented with teaching, communicating, more people-focused elements. And I thought, wow, I found so much reward from that. So um, I, I definitely encourage people to experiment. And I, I give a bit of a three-step process to do it if, if you want it. Yeah. experiment so have a hypothesis first of all right? take a bit of a scientific approach to this have a hypothesis okay i feel that you know i i really want to get into like software development let's say you know, i just i'm kind of interested but i'm not really sure okay so do it try experiment with a, a little course a one hour course do a bit of coding speak to people who are in software engineering then think about how do you feel doing the activity how do you feel after does it align with the sort of effects that i talked about and if yes, great. If not, then go back and refine. Refine your neutral hypothesis and then start to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Start broad and then start to focus in and hone in on what, what that could look like. Um, and I feel, I feel not enough people do that. And we feel like we need to you know, change like you know, seven days of our week. It's like, no, it's, that's, not the, that's not the problem. It's, it's just change an hour of your week, or two hours of your week, whatever is practical for you. Um, and it's not always easy. It's not always easy because the way society is led up is that you're told that fame, anything which is, case, is centered around fame or high, high profit of money, that's, your, you know, that's, that's, your, that's the ideal of success. And it's very not true. My niece, not my niece, my cousin, my little cousin, sister, she's, uh, she was 13, 14 at the time. And she told me, oh, by the time I'm 18, I want to become a billionaire. And I said, uh, I said, well, why, first of all, why? Secondly, how are you going to do that? She goes, oh, one of the, what's her name? Kylie Jenner, one of the yeah. youngest billionaire in the world. Um, and she said, um, well, she did it. But why are you measuring your parameters of success to someone like that who actually is only able to do that because of her family backing and the hard work mother put into the, into the game, right? And it's also, yeah, if I did give you a million pounds by 18 and you did something just to earn the billion pounds by 18, will you feel still a sense of purpose and reason for being? And holistically, will you be happy in life? No, you'll probably be burnt out. 
for the effort you have to do to make a billion pounds by 18, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not that money's not important, it's that our, our g- general well-being is, is governed by more than just our financial status. It's true. If you don't have your health, like what do you have really in life? And, um, you know, Nikhil was making a good point about, you know, focusing on just, you know, if we focus on just money being the goal, you know, money is not going to make us happy. And I've noticed a lot of my patients that I see, some of the patients I see, not a lot, you know, they're working two jobs or they're trying to make a lot more money, you know, doing a side hustle, trying to do this, trying to do that, make themselves get bigger and bigger. And they think that the more that they're doing, the more, you know, the more productive they are, the better they are. But actually what they're doing is it's like, you know, it's almost like you, um, you're working, you're working, you're working, you're working, right? It's, you know, it's an analogy of like, you know, a fly on the, on, the, on the window, right? The fly keeps, you know, running, you know, trying to get out the window, right? So it keeps hitting itself against the window, right? Keeps hitting itself, trying to get out, trying to escape. But the more energy, the more it's hitting itself, the more it's expending energy. And it's not really getting out of the window. But actually, if they're able to go just a few meters, say, say another, I don't know, 100, maybe five centimeters or 10 meters down, and there's actually a window that's open. If the fly manages to get out of the window, it creates momentum, it creates force. It's focused on its dharma, it's got a more of a purpose, so it can fly through that wall, that window, and escape, so you create momentum. So rather than just you know thinking the more that you do, the more happier you become. If I just keep doing side, I was talking about side hustles, Nicole, and the more that you do, yeah. the more you, you get happy. It's actually not the case. It's more important to spend an hour of your time reflecting and thinking about what you want to do and how you want to do it. And that is actually going to make you more happy than just following the crowd. Because everyone just follows the crowd. They don't really think these days. They just sort of... Yeah. And I think the, first, the other point, important point you're saying, Nicola, is I think don't compare yourself to anyone else. Like, you know, talking about Carly Jenner or someone else. You know, it's very important that you remember to always just compare yourself with yourself and find out if how you're feeling inside more than anything else. I think you make a good point there, Rishi, about the comparison point. Now, this is where, you know, the sort of poison of social media comes in because social media can be used to propagate the right message very vastly but can also be used to propagate the wrong message very vastly like uh, you see all these adverts on youtube right like last year i was on youtube and um, this advert came out and, and the man said oh it's 2020 and if you're not a ceo of your own business then what are you doing with your life and i was thinking what a wrong message to give to the mass of people the point is, if everyone's a CEO, then who's going to work for you? And the second yeah. question is, does everyone really have the capability, aptitude, or even desire to want to have their own business? Not necessarily. Yeah. Some people are just very well and happy working for someone in a very standard job. That's completely fine if it's within their dharma. That's completely fine. And I think the opposite to all of this very ambitious thinking about oh, find your dharma, find your calling, is also, you might also be in your calling, you might also be in your dharma, Mm. but sometimes people push you to thinking just because of social pressure. For example, if we take like the Asian community as an example, okay, and this is obviously a fairly generalizing, uh, the usual propaganda, accounting, yeah, you must be an accountant. And you become an accountant and someone says to you, oh, you just done a typical Asian thing, you become an accountant or a doctor. But you didn't want to, did you? You didn't want to, did you? That was me, man. That oh, was me, yeah. Typical Asian. Yeah, oh, maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't. But then you start to question yourself, even though you might be in your dharma, and you'd be like, actually, I love it. I love being an accountant. You know, so we have to, again, do not compare yourself to other people. Just compare yourself to yourself. You are your main competitor. Yes, you know, that self-doubt thing is a very important point, you know. If you self-doubt yourself, you know, which we constantly do with social media, compare, doubt, people put things in your head. It's really about, you know, that's why I think reflection and journaling is really important too. Like if you're writing, spending that hour looking at your values, you should also reflect on how you're feeling internally. I think that's a great, important point, Nicole, that you made. It's so important to pause and stop and and, and do that reflective exercise as step one. Yeah. Um, Because otherwise, you know, years go by so fast and you end up in situations which aren't your dharma and you just feel more upset as time goes on and you don't feel like you're thriving and you're just surviving, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what is it, if there's, are there any categories or anything that you would say you can allocate into like your dharma or what the position is? Yeah, so the Vedic understanding is there are, there are four psychophysical categories or psychophysical natures. Um, 
as, as a basis. And we're basically predominantly one, but sometimes can be a bit of a combination of two. Um, I don't know if you want to get this. Do you want to get the slide up? Um, yeah, which one, which one do you want to put up? The um... uh, 12, so the table. The yeah. table, yeah. Sure. So this is essentially, it's, it's called Varna. Um, it's called Varna, and these are basically activities and motivations which basically govern dharmic dharmic states. So this is just talking in terms of sort of nature and class. So if you just stop on that one, we have four natures or four varnas as it's called. So we have the brahmana, which is the intellectual class. We have the kshatriyas, which is the um, administrative class, governance class. We have the vaishas, which are the mercantile class, the business people, entrepreneurs, um, traders. Then you have the shudra class, which are the laborers, the grafters, the creators, the artists, etc. So I'll start from the top. And as I sort of go through these, anyone who's listening, just think about which one of these resonate to you more in terms of motivation. Uh, I, I find that motivation is the better factor or parameter to understand your nature than the activities, because you can like the activities but have a completely different motivation. So if we start with the intellectual class now, these are the individuals who are more motivated by uh, values such as honesty. Uh, they're very compassionate to other people. Uh, they're often people interested in wisdom and acquiring knowledge and giving knowledge. Uh, they're very tolerant. Um, they you know, are accustomed to taking austerity. And they're also people who like, in terms of an environment, a very peaceful and stable environment in order for them to actually thrive in. They don't necessarily thrive always around very high, intense, passionate environments. The activities that this particular class generally uh, focus on is around the learning, teaching, advising, consult consulting, sharing, communicating knowledge, using their expertise from a knowledge base to advise and guide other people. So as a, a very broad sort of umbrella, that's essentially the activities and the motivation of that class. The second class is the Kshatriya. So the Kshatriyas, if you just go on to, yeah. So they're motivated by, and these aren't negative as well, yeah, these are just values. They're motivated by power, influence, a sense of justice and duty, uh, the want to control, to protect, passion. And you often see these people in society as managers, leaders, governors, administrative individuals, very organized, um, and you see some people naturally gravitate to those, those types of activities. There are certain people who can't help but manage situations. If you try to guide them all the time, you know, they'll just get fed up and they'll just try to manage you, but they can't help it. It's not a bad thing. You mean they can't be they're managed, really... they have to just manage themselves, you mean? They, can't... <laughs> they have to manage themselves and they want to manage other people. <laughs> yeah. They like to take control and natural like leaders, right? Okay. And often what's, what in, in the ideal sort of social structure in the Vedic times, what would happen is the Brahmana class would advise and teach the Kshatriya class on how to manage, guide, and govern society as it were. But, but I don't want to take this from a society angle. These can also be applied in a micro level to our daily lives as well. The Vaisha class, interesting class here. So this is people who are very opportunistic. They like expansion, growth. They're willing to do whatever to gain profit. When they see you, they think, why should I know this individual? What can I gain from them? That's initially how it, and it's not a bad thing because they're brilliant at running businesses. They're brilliant at expanding businesses. You need those motivators in order to run a business properly. Yeah. Unfortunately, today we have, you know, the ethics of business can be questioned, but at a value-based system, this is where the basis of the mercantile class come in. In terms of activities, they, they generally cater towards yeah, merchants, trade, money oriented, business. And now I just want to take a stopper here and just say someone with a Vaisha motivation could do the activity of a Kshatriya or a Brahmana, right? But they'll do it with a different motivation. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So that's why I'm just saying motivators are, are are a better measure of understanding environment. It's the intention of the your intention class. being more important than the actual activity that you're doing, right? Your intention is everything. It's yeah, it's it's it's, it's definitely definitely everything. Um, however, with these motivations and activity, they, they generally pair up quite nicely together and they're quite effective together. But in today's world, again, 
I, as I sort of go through these, I don't want people to think that I'm one or the other. We're predominantly one. We might have a mix of others, but it's good to try and understand where do I predominate? And therefore trying to think about activities that maybe would help that particular class or help that predominance in us. Shudras, again, a very, very important um, class here because these are the individuals which support the effectiveness of all the other classes. They like routine, stability, and they like to feel cared about. They're happy to be led. They're happy to work under individuals who support and assist and do whatever is needed on the ground to make uh, the engine tick, as it were. Yeah? The cogs, the small cogs that make the big engine parts work. In terms of activity, again, support other people. They often quite can be quite creative individuals as well. Um, performers, artists, happy to follow again. Now, I think a, a, key, a key thing here needs to be said is that in terms of hierarchy, no one is more important than the other. Uh, often, um, you know, in, in terms of modern sort of car system, that can be uh, a bit of a misconception that one is better than the other. Not one is better than the other. You have to understand which you are, and therefore that is best for you. If you had someone in a Shudra class being put into a Kshatriya role, just because they thought it was better, uh, one, they would not be very good at the activity, they would hate doing the activity, and then they would just feel a sense of being out of their dharma, and therefore all those effects of being out of your dharma, the self-worth, you know, the, the sense of self-confidence, all those things start to reduce, and they feel that they're just surviving in that role as opposed to thriving in that role. Um, I'll just take a stop of there, if there's anything you want to share, or I mean, if you if you say that you're thanks for that. If you say you're a sudra, though, then does that mean you know you're happy to be led? Are you saying that you need to be submissive, or you know if people could just start arguing that, you know, the whole point is to be at the top to be number one, right? So why would you want to be anything but number one? How would you? Well, why not be a number one sudra? That's the thing. Yeah. Why? Why? There is no again. This is not hierarchy that Brahman is number one. No. Because actually, if you're a Shudra thinking that you want to be a Brahman and you be a Brahman, actually, you're number zero. You're nobody because actually you can't do that role properly. Yeah. Right. And vice versa. And vice versa. So in terms of society, and this is where society is very interesting, is currently society is very Vaisha driven. It's very profit driven. So if you look at large businesses, whoever can give the most value to the business, if you look at the corporate environment, Whoever can, they look at, what's your value add? You know, this common buzzword, what's your value add? How are you going to bring me value? And how is that going, how can I sell you essentially to clients to make the organization more, more money, right? Yeah. I don't care what you can do. What can you do that's going to make me money? And therefore, the Vaisha, it's a very Vaisha thriving environment. Do whatever I can to gain profit. Yeah? For, for the Brahmana class, they aren't very profit driven at all. They're not very profit driven at all. Quite, they're quite appalling at business because they philosophize about business. They tell you the best business ideas, but they won't actually do it. Right? <laughs> That's the thing. They're, Sounds they're like my dad. Sounds like my dad. He's very intelligent. So. <laughs> <laughs> right? They can't get things done. They can't get things done. That's why the Kshatriya class are there to get things done, manage it, and the Vaishas are there with you know, doing the deals, doing the negotiations, mm -hmm. you know, profiting and, and, and expanding, etc. So they all need each other. They work in tandem to create yeah. quite a powerful team. Um, and it's really, really interesting. Like I've really looked at these and, and when you know your own dharma, it's very easy to spot other people's dharma as well. And therefore, you know how to interact with them. You know how to get the best out of them and make them feel satisfied and, and purposeful. Hmm. Um, what do you think my dharma and again, is? What do you think mine is then? I've thought about this. I was thinking about this like recently when we've been speaking. Um, I'll put you on the spot. I know. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say you've got, into, I, mean, I always think in terms of intention, I would think you've got a lot of Brahmana traits. Okay. Uh, because you have a level of compassion to always help educate and communicate best practice hmm. uh, to people. I, I, I wouldn't say I see so much Kshatriya in you because Kshatriyas are also quite domineering, passionate, controlling individuals. Vaishas, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I don't know yet. I, I was on to test that side. And Shudra, I think it's fair to say everyone has a level of Shudra in them due to the current world and the way, uh, the way we are. And according to the Vedic, Vedic understanding in this age that we live in currently, um, we all have an element of Shudra in us. So we will all have a mix, but it's, I find it's important to understand um, 
One is important to understand your predominance, but it's also important to understand not to promise yourself that you're going to find a 100% perfect job career situation for yourself. The world is not set up to um, facilitate for a perfect dharmic society. The world is set up for profit and gain, according to the capitalist world, right? So yeah. therefore, the best thing we can do is at least maybe get 80%, 70%, try to get as close to perfect as we can, just so that we can control the level of difficulty in our lives. And I feel that's really, really important to, to make that statement there, because often people paint a false picture. They need to understand also the reality of the world that we live in and use these elements to slowly, slowly push ourselves to something we feel much more um, happy with. That's super useful. That's very useful. Obviously, if you have any questions and stuff, let me know. I think Daniel was talking about, um, he said, you know, that first question you raised, uh, Dr. Sean Powell was saying, you know, what we do is usually defined by, um, you know, we identify a lot with our jobs. So people, most people ask, you know, go, you know, what do you do? You know, I normally ask that question, like, what do you do? You know, it's like your job defines you as opposed to like, you know, how you're feeling or what's going on in your life, you know? It's interesting, yeah. isn't it, how we tend to define people or judge people based on what they do. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny example. Um, so, so when I used to live in the temple, right? So obviously it's a different structure. It's a different structure to the corporate environment. So when I left that sort of charity, not non-profit environment and moved into the professional uh, consulting world, I was, um, I was in a job and my manager at the time, she introduced me to one of the partners of the business, right? Partner, top guy. And... Uh, she said, oh, this is, ex this is a partner of, of, of this company. I was like, oh, okay. And then everyone was speaking very highly about the partners, but I didn't associate the job role to the individual. All I saw was this, this, this guy, very experienced, good at what he does. But what happens in today's world is because we're so consumed by like our working environments and our identification according to job role, we say that this person is a partner, senior manager, X, Y, Z, assistant, doctor, and we that's like a major like identifier to that individual. And then we either praise or, or, or dominate that individual according to that particular title. But they are so much more than a job title. Yeah. They have a life, they have values, they have motivations and intentions. I think they are so much better identificators than identifiers than a job role. Job role, you know, you step outside that company, you are no longer the X, Y, and Z of that company. You're just the regular human being walking down the street. No one knows who you are. Exactly. Right? And then this is where the sort of spiritual side of things really kick in. It's about sense of self-realization. You are not a job role. You are so much more than your physical circumstances around you. And um, th that stresses people out a lot. You know, uh, that stresses people out a lot. And we need to learn to healthily detach from that. Well, that's really helpful. That's really useful. So we talked a lot about, you know, you know, stop surviving, start thriving, looking at your job role, looking at what you want to do in life, even in just one hour a, a week, you know, just to have a look at what you want to do. So it's like, you know, reflect, look at your role. What's the word you said? You said one hour of, is it reflection or not? What's the word? Trying, experimenting, so experimenting, experimenting, one hour of experimenting, and then refining, yeah. and then, you know, redefining your, your life. Okay. Goals, so yeah. experiment, reflect, and then refine on it. Okay, experiment, reflect, and then redefine refine your refine your uh, that's great and then your dharma is the dharmic processes is there any other take-home messages you want to talk about nicole anything that you want to i think it's, messages yeah and i think one thing is sometimes people fear are, are scared of change and people fear change but what you do is you have to understand when you start to experiment with something which is in your dharma it will build faith within you to pursue that dharma further and further and further because it builds a sense of fearlessness, right? And I just feel like not enough people control factors of their life they can make easier to make their overall life easier. Because sometimes, you know, we, what I'm trying to say here, sorry, it's not coming across well, is you don't have to suffer. Um, you're, you are not, you are not, um, you're not subject to uncontrollable suffering all the time. You have control over certain knobs in your life, which you can turn, twist, and remove yeah. in order to actually um, succeed and thrive and feel a lot more happier in life. You, there, is no, there is no need to think that you need to give up on and, and just surrender to your certain circumstances at the moment. 
it's better to try experiment and fail at an activity than just surrender to an activity and feel like I've never really tried pursuing what my purpose could be. Um, and I think another factor is don't think that just because you're in your dharma, you're going to be the most famous, most uh, you know, wealthy person in the world. That's not the case. Holistic balance is not about being super rich. Holistic balance is about feeling successful and, and, and fulfilled in all aspects of your life financially, mental health, well-being, time, enthusiasm, mental, or the mental power, enthusiasm, physical strength, and your central awareness. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's do not fear and try. Whatever is practical for you, at least get on that journey. And no one's ever too old or too young to, to do that. Um, obviously, the younger you are, the more time you have. So take, take advantage now, fail fast, as opposed to, uh, you know, um, having to fail largely. <laughs> <You're old. laughs> yeah, like, yeah, and, and it's such an important part. It's, it's, you are your own individual. Don't compare yourself. There is no room for comparison. There's only room for encouragement. And, and don't ever push your own dharma on other individuals because everyone's very different. And everyone's a unique, a unique, um, a com unique combination of various environments. Of, mm -hmm. of various types and various interests. Like for me, I tell you, lockdown for me has been the worst because I hate being inside. I love the feeling of outside and traveling. Like I will drive to Scotland and it will give me joy. When I go to an Are you airport, sure about I that? You'll drive to Scotland and it'll give you joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would love the process. I would love the journey. Yeah. Like I like going to an airport even if I'm not flying anywhere because of the sense of travel. It's just how my, my, my mind and body work, where some people love being inside and are thriving at the moment in lockdown. Well, some individuals lockdown, it just, yeah. it's like a prison house, you know? A lot of my so, patients, I think, are, are not, are, some people are liking it, but most people I know aren't liking yeah. the isolation. And, you know, I know what you mean. It depends on each person's, yeah. you know. You know depends. depends. Natural, you know, in tendency, I suppose. That's what we're trying to say. Yeah. No, that's great, Nicole. No, I really appreciate you and thank you for coming on. It's great to talk to you. No, it's, it's I just want to have a look, you know, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, Priya was like, no, thanks so much for that. Really appreciate your conversation and talk. It was a uh, great listening to you. People saying thanks a lot. And um, no, Nick, no, Nicole, again, no, thanks very much. And um, of course, if you've got any other questions, yeah. you can always send us messages or send me messages later. I can speak to Nicole, whatever. Um, did you want to plug anything, Nicole? before we leave no if, if if you want to connect you can find me on linkedin I, I don't really use any other social media at the moment but you can find me on linkedin i'm always happy to connect and and, uh, and tiktok don't forget questions. tiktok nicole you're on tiktok aren't you no i'm not <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no i don't do that <laughs> no, no, it's fine no thanks obviously thanks yeah. again guys obviously you hear this talk it's on facebook it's also going to be on youtube and um also check out dr.shonpow.com for like i do regular blogs we do a weekly show every week. Uh, and the next person on the show after Nickel is going to be Wim Hof. Yes, the Iceman who's broken many Guinness Book of Records. We're talking about stress and or beating stress and, the, and inflammation. Um, yeah, well, we're going to have a special title for that. So we're looking forward to it. And thanks again, Nickel. Really appreciate your help. Um, no worries. Thanks, thanks for having me. And um, I just want to mention that this topic is very, very vast. Uh, we, we can go on this topic in days and make it very practical so hopefully everyone listening has gotten something out of it and um, hopefully it's been somewhat valuable to everyone um, and that's essentially my goal that we, we we start to think about this thing a little bit more so thanks for listening thanks for inviting me uh, rishi and uh yeah great thanks nicole thanks again thanks everyone thanks take care. Take care. bye 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 thanks everyone bye bye